Elaine, I would like to welcome you to uh, to our uh, Cambridge University Press uh, Facebook Live session about uh, international management behavior, global and sustainable leadership. What we're going to do is we're going to tell you a little bit about who we are, uh, our backgrounds, uh, why the book was written, uh, what it is, at least how we think about it, and uh, the major components of it, and we'll hopefully leave plenty of time for, for questions. And we're joined, as you can see, by Martha Mesnev. Uh, I'm, I'm a native of Boston, which you can probably already tell from my, my accent. I went to the University of Massachusetts. After that, I was in the U.S. Army for, for four years. I was the commanding officer of a guided missile repair detachment in Germany, which was my first international experience. After I got out of the army, I moved back to Boston. Uh, I worked for a number of years, did my MBA part-time at Boston College. Then I went to the Harvard Business School to get my doctorate in organizational behavior. When I was finishing my doctorate, I was recruited to the Western Business School, now Ivy, and I'll refer to it as Ivy, uh, by Joe DiStefano, who was the co-author of the first couple of editions of the text. Uh, then in around 1998, my wife told me she was going home and I could come if I wanted to, which is how I happened to wind up back in Boston. I took an endowed chair at Northeastern. Uh, and during that time at Northeastern, I was also the acting dean. Martha. Hi, Martha Mesnevsky, um, and it's really fun to be here doing this and to be working with Harry and, and as you said, Joe Stefano for many years on this. I am Canadian, um, and I grew up in the Toronto region, which is really multicultural. So my first passion for cross-cultural work came from working in a very, very multicultural environment and, and uh, seeing both the benefits of that, but also the struggles of it and, and how you could get performance from that. Um, so eventually I went to do my PhD and Joe DiStefano, who was the co-author on the first editions of this book, was my supervisor and then Harry was my co-supervisor. So it was really fun to work with them and have the opportunity to do that uh, on both of them. Um, since then, I, worked, I was a professor at University of Virginia for a while, so lived in the United States. And then I spent a good chunk of my career at IMD in Switzerland, working mainly with executives all over the world. Now back at Ivy, happy to be back in Canada where the passion all started uh, and, and representing the book back at Ivy. Okay, and before we move on, I just wanna mention that uh, the views expressed in this, in this session are those of responsibility of Martha and myself and not necessarily uh, Cambridge University Press. So the first, the first issue that we wanted to deal with was why was the book written? Well, in the early 1980s, uh, I was working in Kenya. This was my second uh, international experience, I suppose, other than moving to Canada, helping establish businesses between Canadian and Kenyan companies. And we were also running an executive education course, a two-week mini MBI, MBA in Kenya, and we did that for, for six years. I had been working in Kenya off and on there for about four years, and I wasn't and I was teaching the International Management Behavior Course at, at Ivy. And I wasn't satisfied with any of the existing options for course material. None of them seemed to deal with the reality that I was experiencing on the ground. Uh, and so that's when I decided that I was going to write a book because I thought the combination of experience that we had, things that we knew, the cases that we wrote, uh, would be useful for people, uh, and so that's how it all began. And uh, so I came in, sorry, Harry, is, did you just do a baton? Is that to me now? Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I came on with the third edition, as I said earlier, I was working with Harry and Joe on my PhD, where, and, and the main element of my PhD was what we know today as the MapBridge Integrate model. Um, we developed it and tested it in, in my dissertation. And so Harry and Joe invited me to become part of the book journey with them, um, and, and it's just been a pleasure 
to be doing that ever since through all of the different evolutions. Uh, I started with the third edition. Now we're on the eighth, eighth edition. We've experimented with different formats uh, and, and different ways of putting it together. Um, but, but it keeps its true spirit. And I think most importantly, um, we, we think of it as a lighthouse. This is the metaphor that Harry and I use for it. Um, lighthouses are, are navigation aids to help people go safely. They don't do the whole job for you, but they're very practical. They guide people towards uh, away from dangers and towards safe places. Um, and experienced sailors know how to, to work with the lighthouses together to signal where they're going. Um, so we think this is a really important metaphor for the book, and it's really very practical. Yes, there, there is theory in it, uh, there's guidance, but overall it aims towards practice and helping both current and future leaders and executives be able to be very effective in cross-cultural, multinational, uh, international situations. Um, the book has, uh, has basically four sections to it. Uh, it's the four sections are, um, there's the new, oh no, now I hand it back to you. Sorry, <laughs> Harry, <laughs> but on back. No, not a problem. Why don't you put up that, uh, well, yes. Uh, in the eighth edition, uh, the conception of mindful global leadership is new in this edition. And what it does is it provides an integrating framework for examining the execution of global operations and strategy across cultures and distance. Uh, we adopted uh, Ellen Langer's conception of mindfulness from her book entitled uh, Mindfulness. And I'm not sure why I was reading it, but as I was reading it, the realization hit me that what she was talking about was exactly what I had been teaching uh, for all these years. Uh, first was the openness to new information leading to the ability to see the world differently than before, creating awareness of multiple perspectives, which you can also think of as global mindset. But beyond just the psychology, the psychological aspects of the global mindset, was the ability to overcome past rules, routines, distinctions that influenced our behavior, and to be able to create new categories to structure your perception and thus actions. The other thing she talked about was that mindful executives were context aware and process oriented. In terms of context awareness, uh, the two that I have seen overlooked continually and that I have always taught about in this course, uh, national culture, obviously, but then the organizational heritage of the company, their, spread, their existing strategy systems, their organizational uh, context and how they very often could not align that with the national culture of country they were operating in. And the second thing that she mentioned was being process oriented. And this struck me too is not simply a focus on end results, but having a plan on how to achieve that goal, the goal or those results. Uh, what I had seen with the companies that we had taught and I had worked with executives was there was a strong emphasis on strategy, but little or, or no emphasis on implementation. Uh, and I also had read a book about uh, the art of Japanese management by Richard Pascal and Tony Athos, that they talked about proceeding as opposed to deciding. And what I had always been teaching in this course was managing change. So as I read this and thought about what I was teaching, it struck me that uh, the notion of mindful global leadership uh, would be an appropriate integrating uh, framework for this, for this text. Okay, Martha. So uh, Harry and I are, are passionate teachers as well as really caring about the practice uh, and that. And so we've organized the book into four sections uh, that increasingly address more complex uh, practic 
practical applications uh, and different kinds of contexts. So taking this idea of looking at the landscapes, having the new eyes, increasing your mindfulness in these different contexts. The first part is about the new global context. So specifically identifying these ideas and putting them in the context. And the next edition is gonna to have to talk about COVID, Harry. Uh, leading, the second section is uh, leading people across context. So focus is very much on interpersonal interactions. The third section is on executing strategy and performance. Uh, as Harry's referring to, putting together the strategies, but with a real focus on execution. And the fourth section is on inte integrity and sustainable performance. So we're going to focus the rest of our comments here on sections two, three, and four. Um, and, and just to show you also how we think about things, um, kind of what's behind the scenes when we're writing. Um, we think very much in terms of these, these increasingly complex and important types of knowledge. So what, then how, then when. And, and this is also related to Bloom's taxonomy of knowledge, if you've used that, and, and other ways of seeing knowledge. Basically, the first, the first part is the what, it's the information. This is the data, it's the terminology, it's the concepts, it's the frameworks. Application is putting it into practice. Um, and and then when is more like the judgment. So how do you decide? How do you make decisions? How do you put them into context? How do you adapt solutions as you go? And so each of these levels or types of knowledge is more and more complex. Um, and what we've tried to do through the text and through each of these themes is really anchor a how. So we've got kind of a main framework for each section that's about the how. And then we in, before we introduce that framework, we introduce knowledge that is important for the what. And then we apply uh, that framework to a lot of different contexts to, to look at the when. So I'll just I'll walk through that logic using the first uh, the, the second section of the book, which is um, the cross-cultural interaction and cross-cultural effectiveness. All right. So so. The main framework here is the MapBridge Integrate Framework, um, which is what we've learned is a, a very practical process for getting people who have different ways of seeing the world to understand each other and be able to work together. So mapping is understanding the differences, bridging is communicating effectively, taking the differences into account, and integrating is managing the differences to achieve innovative solutions. But before we introduce MapBridge Integrate, we know that in a multicultural context, one of the important pieces of information is understanding culture. So there's a whole chapter on, on the what, and we've got the Globe Smart profile um, in a partnership with, with Globe Smart and Aperion around that. Uh, and so we introduce that and give a lot of examples about how culture works and how you can map culture. Then we introduce Map Bridge Integrate in the next chapter with, again, a lot of examples of putting it into context. And then we take it even more uh, complex, for example, in teams, and we look at a lot of different kinds of, of teams and a lot of different kinds of uh, permutations of when people are working together. Okay, so that's that MapBridge Integrate anchors that, but it's it's got the what, how, and when. Um, Harry, you're gonna, oh, sorry, I, we have a slide with the MapBridge Integrate to get into a little bit more detail on that. This is, uh, as we say, it's one of the core frameworks that we use, um, and we've, we think it's really fascinating. What we've learned in our research from this is that performance comes from integrating. So if you manage the difference as well, you get performance. Uh, and the performance is of, is innovation, creativity, um, and and new solutions. But what we find in our research is that the more diverse the team, the more bridging accounts for the variance in integrating. In other words, if you get bridging right, you almost automatically get integrating. If you don't get bridging right, you don't get any integrating. Uh, and then the mapping is really important for that. So, so this, this becomes a real anchor for the first part of the book and working through the cases, um, which are the kind of the final way of applying that that are in the book. Harry, do you want to give us the, uh, the next yeah. one? And as we move into the, the third uh, major part of the book, we tend to move up from the individual and team level of analysis uh, to the organizational level analysis. 
And this is something else that I find people don't think a lot about. When you talk about managing cross-culturally, everybody thinks about the individual aspects of it and the differences in culture. But they don't often think about how their systems, their selection systems, their reward systems, their evaluation systems, and their training systems might be uh, culturally influenced and may not be uh, in alignment with the new culture or country that they're, they're working in. And so we move into uh, the strategic organizational alignment, which is the, the second major how, if you will. I think of these as tools, uh, tools for that people can take away with, with them after the course or after the program uh, that they can use in, in their own companies. And so we have the strategic organization alignment framework, which is a traditional, I suppose, framework uh, for anybody talking about strategy or implementing strategy. There are various uh, models of this. There's the, the STAR model, there's the McKinsey 7S model. And since uh, probably I came out of Harvard and Paul Lawrence was my piece of supervisor, uh, my background really is organization design and uh, organization theory. Uh, so I have my own little version of it that includes very specifically uh, environment and, and task. Uh, so we will we will talk about this and we will uh, we have cases uh, that illustrate the, the misalignments that, that can happen. And so that was the, the second major context, the first major context being culture, the second major context being the administrative heritage and uh, organizational system. And then we also now have to talk about how do you go about implementing whatever you're going to do. And that's where the, uh, the major framework about the, the, uh, the organizational change framework. And this is something that has also been uh, in the course from, uh, from the early days. And so we now have seen, if you will, uh, the characteristics of mindful global leadership, which is having an open mind, being prepared to act differently, see the world differently, uh, understand something about the different cultural contexts that we're in, and now understanding something about our own organizational context and how that may or may not fit with the uh, the uh, the country that we're that we're operating. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to keep on going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we get to the, uh, to the last part of the book. Uh, and what happened, let me give you very quickly. Uh, this, the, the initial, uh, the first edition of the book was written in 1988. And since then, every year I learn more either through research or wandering the world and practicing, if you will. And as I told you, we, uh, well, we ran an executive education course in Kenya for, for six years. And this is where chapter 10 began, not on the, uh, the beach at uh, the Ali Beach Hotel in Mombasa or at the Tida Hills Lodge in uh, Tida Hills in Savo West, Kenya, uh, but in Kenya uh, through activities, research, face writing. I began to be exposed and learn about different situations, uh, ethical situations. Uh, and so I started what I realized that if we were writing a book on international management behavior, then this is something managers should understand and have some way of thinking about. And so, to be honest, I suppose, I wrote chapter 10, competing with integrity, personal integrity, uh, is a way of helping myself think about what I would do in some of these situations. Uh, should I be asked or should I be asked to do something I didn't think that I really wanted to do? So that's how uh, uh, chapter 10 began uh, and where it began, given my experiences working in, in Africa. Um, and let me just say before I get to the, the next part and, and describing the last chapter, um, when I w first met Harry and Joe, 
uh, I was uh, most impressed, very, very impressed with this part of the book, that it was already in there from the beginning about integrity. Harry had just published an article called Bribery, Whose Problem Is It Anyway? And really uh, an unusual perspective at the time, but a very powerful one, talking about how it's often expats behavior that increases the act of bribery in the first place. Uh, and that if you build high integrity ethical relationships, then you won't have those those uh, situations arise as much in the first place. So I was really influenced by that. Um, and it's been a really important part of the book all along. And it's it's evolved to different frameworks as the field of ethics has evolved as well. But it's, it's right from the beginning, it's always been part of it. And then we've also added a, a final chapter, oops, um, uh, on sustainable corporate sustainability. And again, the terminology on this has, has changed over time, but we really believe that these two focuses on integrity, personal and corporate, are important for looking at implementing international management behavior anywhere. So we look at uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. We look at how they are manifested differently in different parts of the world, um, and there are different approaches to it. Uh, but we really look at the importance of business as being a responsible part of society. So I think so. That's uh, that's our overview of the book. You know, I think uh, the, our suggestion. So we've got a comment here. Economic is the important issue right now, and don't see people here. I'm not sure what you mean by the second part. Don't see people here, but economic clearly uh, is important. And Harry, you might want to just like we we talk about that in the first part of the book, right? The economic um, uh, crises and volatilities and complexity. Yeah, and we talked about how it had changed. I mean, when we first started writing the book, maybe around the third edition or something like that, globalization was the hot topic. All companies were striving to become global and had to put a big push on to, to globalize. Uh, and by the time we got to the eighth edition, there was a lot of questions about globalization uh, and also the dark side of globalization. So we started to to put some of that information in about uh, uh, the dark side of globalization and maybe the discrepancies in uh, uh, incomes or wealth that, that it has created. Although everybody has made out probably well overall, uh, there have been some large uh, discrepancies and in, in differences in, in uh, income and wealth. So we put that in. Uh, and so we keep adding, and as Martha said, the next edition will have to cover COVID and other things like that. But I, I, overall, I think the frameworks adapt well to that. Don Murray's got a question. Why did you wait until latter chapters for ethics? <laughs> I think it, it, let, let's also say it's it does we it's in, it's introduced earlier. Um, so it all, right from the beginning, we talk about taking a, an ethical, responsible approach. Um, and all of the cases and the way that we teach them, so the teaching notes, um, have that as an undergoing theme. We just thought it was really important to also dive into it separately and really focus on it. Harry, I mean, that was your decision originally. The questions pop up. I've been searching for them frantically. Uh, it, it, it was also uh, the time in which it wasn't included probably in the first two, the first two editions. Uh, but as I said, is the longer I worked in places like Africa uh, and became exposed to these situations, uh, I realized that this had to go in. Uh, and so it was added, and little by little, uh, it, we started adding uh, corporate social responsibility in there and eventually realized that we had to make two, two separate chapters out of that material. And so we divided it into personal integrity and corporate social responsibility. Yeah, so, so not because it's not important, but uh, okay. So Rebecca's got a, a question for us here. What features does the textbook have that support distance teaching? And what's your advice for instructors? So I'll, uh, Harry's done, Harry has taught this course online for years, but, but let me just say something before I turn it over to him on that. Um, I, I really think that what we teach in this course, in this book, has to lend itself to distance teaching because the managers who are doing this are usually working apart from each other. 
Um, and so, you know, actually we, we take into account all the way through the book that probably there are lots of times when you're not working close uh, face to face with each other. We address it explicitly in the virtual team section, but it's, you know, it's all through the book. Um, and uh, so we just think that this is an opportunity for a course like this to say, look, we're doing what the management is as, as we do it. Now, Harry, you've got a more specific answer to that because you've been teaching this course virtually for a long time. Yes, uh, and for the last two weeks, I have also been mentoring uh, faculty on teaching online, and I don't want to get, get into all the things I've learned about teaching online, but the book, you can use the book, and we have used it for 14 years, I guess, in our online MBA program. Uh, specific what... Let me talk about not just the book, but you also have to go into the instructor's manual. Uh, in the book, we yeah. have, you know, we use cases. I do a case on, uh, uh, on the, in the online MBA program, very similar to the way I do it in, in person, except we're not talking to each other. It's not live. 95% of our online MBA is asynchronous. And one of the things I've learned is asynchronicity is your friend. Uh, and you really need to try to make uh, as much of your course asynchronous and interactive as possible. Uh, the book really supports that. Uh, for example, the Delta Beverages case. Uh, we put people in, it's a team decision-making exercise, and it's also an exercise in learning about uh, expatriate uh, selection, global leader selection. And we put people into teams. They have to work together across uh, time and distance. And so they're practicing what it is in the chapter of the material on virtual teams, global virtual teams. Uh, there are a lot of uh, videos that are recommended in the instructor's manual. One in particular that comes to mind is uh, the Danger of the Single Story by Chimamanda Radici, which is a TED Talk, which is very powerful. And so there's a lots of ways in which you can you can use the book. We have the, the Globe Smart Profile. So you're going to be going online and getting your profile. And then the assignments that you'll find in the instructor's manual have you compare it with members of your team, for example. So uh, there are a lot of ways in which you can you can use the book, and I have found it to be very successful uh, in the 14 years that we've been using it in our online MBA program. Oh, it's uh, also say things like it, um, the the note about the instructor manual. We haven't talked about that, but but uh, Harry and I spent almost as much time on the instructor manual as we did on the book itself. Um, because we, we, again, the teaching is really important. So all the teaching notes are there, yeah, the slides as well, um, but also a lot of information about uh, exercises and other things. In the chapters, there are um, questions, reflection questions at the end of each chapter. And they're designed so that over the course of the book, the, you develop a lot of self-awareness and ability to put these things in practice. Those would lend themselves really well to an online journal um, and, uh, and, and online discussions among students as well. So lot, lots of ways of, of adapting it. And I think, again, just also having the, uh, the philosophy that by teaching online, you're doing what the, what the book is about and what the course is about. Yeah, and the, the uh, people in our online MBA program tend to be sort of the age uh, and seniority of executive MBA. And so they have an awful lot of international experience and a lot of good work experience. And I'm amazed at the number of them that share their experiences with their classmates about working in global virtual teams and say things like, oh my word, I had that experience yesterday or boy, am I glad that we talked about this case today because I have to come to Mexico tomorrow. Uh, so it really fits in with the working professional uh, in particular. They see a lot in it that, uh, that they've experienced. Yeah, and the other the, um, nice thing about virtual is uh, so so students are distributed and there are different places. That means they're all sitting in different contexts. Um, and again, one of the important themes of the book is to become aware of context. 
And I actually find it sometimes hard when you've got all the students in the same program in the same room to get them to talk about different contexts because because um, if they're not experienced with a lot of international settings, it's hard for them to grasp this idea that the context is, is different. But when they're sitting in different places, you can have them compare their context uh, and that actually brings to life some of the um, some of the concepts more. Always an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, so Teodoro followed up um, his question to us, Harry, uh, about the economic being the most important issue. And he says he's worried about the virus issue, but also what comes ahead uh, with this crisis. So, so what, you know, what, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure we can resolve it, but how would you teach about that? Uh, if I, no one knows. If I knew, I would, uh, I'd be on CNN every night. Uh, and I think that's something that we're going to have to deal with in the, uh, in the, in the coming editions. Uh, so I, I don't know. But so, as I said, you know, each year I learn something uh, more and think about a different way to deal with these issues or novel, uh, approaches and so i look forward to uh to learning as as well as you do Theodora. yeah and uh, harry i'm thinking about some of the other conversations we've had around uh the virus and that and i think a couple of things one again what's already in the book um will be helpful on some of this so the importance of innovation uh, and using global experiences to move things from one market to another. And that's going to be extra important in COVID recovery. Uh, I'm also thinking, um, you know, you were, you were part of a talk the other a couple of weeks ago, Harry, where you're talking about global supply chains and, and moving goods and that. And you were talking again about the importance of integrity, ethics, responsibility, um, and values. So I think that might be relevant here too. Well, as, as uh, I start thinking, I think one of the more obvious uh, answers to that question is the ability to work across cultures and to build uh, coalitions, which is something we're not doing very well in the United States today. Uh, this is a global problem. This is not a French, French problem or a Canadian problem, or, uh, but we're not... Uh, doing very well in that in that respect. So I think that's something that we'll be talking about and the importance about understanding and working with people from other cultures uh, to build those coalitions uh, to solve problems that are world problems and not just problems of a, of a single country. And one other theme I think is going to be important that we might see in the next edition of the book as a result of COVID is the acceleration of digitization and uh, the data availability changes how organizations work. So, so the same organizational model, the alignment, but if you've got information flow that's completely different and, and much more information flow, then that changes a lot of how uh, other systems need to be aligned. Um, and I think that's going to be another interesting effect. But, you know, Teodoro, we'd love to hear your ideas too uh, about what, what, what you think we're going to be seeing and what, what comes ahead. Um, yeah. So what platforms have you used for distance teaching? What would you recommend? Well, uh, for well, 14 years, our online MBA has been on Blackboard and we use Blackboard Collaborate. We are in the process of transitioning to Canvas uh, as I speak. What I learned this year was that uh, Zoom had been integrated into Blackboard. And so for my uh, live chats on Wednesday night, I started using Zoom uh, and it was much better then Blackboard Collaborate. Martha joined us on, on one of those. So, uh, so far it's just been uh, Blackboard, Zoom, and uh, I am learning about Collaborate, which is what, I mean, sorry, about Canvas, which is what the, the course will be uh, housed on when it starts again in the end of August. 
And we, um, I, I'm familiar with Canvas, uh, so I've used it a lot. In terms of video, I, I like Zoom. I think it's very intuitive for people used to case teaching with all the breakout room features and, and the different features. It feels very much like a case classroom. Um, it, it, as much as you can virtually. So I like that. Uh, at Ivy, we're part of something called a FOME Alliance, F-O-M-E, which is a, a federation of management education schools that are working together under the leadership of Imperial College in London to develop a, a, a platform that specifically works really well with business school teaching. Um, and so that's been really interesting. And we also, so we also have that, it's called Incendi. Um, it's, it's still in beta stages, um, but it, it's very specific to the kinds of teaching that we do in business schools. Um, and, and I like that too. I have to say, um, you know, I, I teach a lot of executive education where those kinds of platforms are not necessarily in place. Uh, you put big platforms in place for a big institution. Um, but if you're if you're a company, you're probably not going to be implementing Canvas. Um, and, and then if you're talking to people a lot across companies, you, you're also not so likely to do that. Exec Online is another one that I've worked with with a, a proprietary platform. But I um, learned from a, a, a good colleague uh, about the importance of having three technologies, and you can have them all all in one with Canvas or you can have them in different ways uh, with, with things like Google Meeting or Google Hangouts or, or other ways. You need, you need a video conferencing that lets you have pretty intuitive conversations. So that's one piece, um, and that simulates the classroom discussion. Then you need a technology that simulates the whiteboards or the blackboards that you would have in a classroom. So that might be Google Docs. Uh, it might be, you know, the, on, on Canvas or Microsoft Teams, there are shared documents ways, um, but but you need to have some way of, of simulating what would go on to a shared uh, viewing space that everybody can see. And then the third thing you need is the quarters, the the coffee rooms. You know, you need, a, you need some way to have coffee room chats, informal chats. And again, it could be Slack, it could be um, could be Messenger, it, 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 it almost doesn't matter what it is. If it's all integrated into Canvas, that's nice. Um, but but it, if you can't have it all integrated in one place, as long as you have those three technologies, then that works really well for uh, facilitating or teaching online. And there's, there's one other that I never heard about, but I learned about it from Cambridge University Press. Uh, and if you don't have Canvas or Blackboard, uh, there's a platform called Perusal, P-E-R-S-U-A-L-L, -L -L, that was developed by Eric Mazur at uh, Harvard University and some of his colleagues, uh, which is really very, very interesting and useful. I was thinking about trying to incorporate it along with Blackboard into my online course but decided against it only because we had a lot of the functionality in, in Blackboard. But if you don't have Blackboard or Canvas or an LMS like that, uh, you should really take a look at it. One of the nice features about it is that the textbooks are available, electronic versions of the textbooks are available on it. So if you have people spread around the world, uh, they might not be able to get the text that you're using. So in my course that ended in June, I had one student in Barcelona and another one in Dubai. Uh, and Cambridge University Press very graciously made the electronic version of the book available for free uh, through the end of May for, uh, uh, for students through their library systems. But with Perusal, you can go online or you can go on to Perusal, tell them what your text is, it's probably there. Students can get a, an electronic version of the test text and generally less, uh, less costly than uh, through Amazon or through the university bookstore. And so our, our text is available on, uh, uh, on Caruso. So just another thought. Good. Um, <laughs> keeping students and others engaged. Is this so, so virtually or at all? Rebecca, maybe you can uh, clarify. Like if we've got bored undergrads in class, how do we keep them engaged or, or, or both? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so I, you know, I think both Harry and I, the first basic answer to that question, advice for keeping students and others engaged, um, make it relevant and make it relevant to them. Um, so, so, you know, relevant to business or relevant to the context. And that's where the cases are, are really fun and interesting and helpful and, uh, and the exercises. And then a lot of the exercises that we have in the uh, instructor's manual are very, very much about getting them engaged uh, themselves. So, so their physical activities, um, and they can uh, they can have dialogue around them, but they're very, very relevant to them. Um, and 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 that's true virtually as well as face to face. Really, you know, it's um, if, if it's relevant and it's relevant to me, and I'm learning about myself, uh, that tends to keep students engaged. Dialogue. Uh, anything where you're getting the students to talk with each other, they're more likely to, to stay engaged. Harry, what does, what does that trigger for you? Yeah, uh, things that I was talking about uh, yesterday with my second mentee on online learning. Uh, one of the things that would make it as interactive as possible. Uh, have the students do things together to the extent that you can. And one person recommended, uh, even during the class, uh, having uh, uh, people in teams to have a discussion amongst themselves for five or ten minutes uh, in team rooms on, on Zoom. And this is something that Martha and other people at IMD used to do frequently with the, in, in the classrooms. Uh, so make it interactive, uh, have people talking to one another, put them in teams, have team projects, uh, and do things like that. Uh, discussion boards where they have to talk to each other uh, and respond to each other. This will, will keep them engaged. And I think one of the things that I learned uh, is, I don't know if you're familiar with the meme that came out of Lord of the Rings, but Borodia says, one does not simply walk into Mordor. Well, <laughs> one does not simply put your course online. What it does is it forces you to, to do a lot more planning and thinking up front. And you have to remember, and Martha will remember this one, uh, teaching isn't, isn't important. Learning is. Learning is more important than teaching. So your job is to structure the learning situation and the learning experience, not to try to go online and, and do exactly what you do in class. So, uh, and for example, I mean, you, you can do this with any case, right? So, so right at the beginning of a case discussion, you can say, would you go ahead this, with this or would you not? You know, Magdi Potato, Nest, Nestle Malaysia, uh, would you go ahead with teams or not? Um, and then you, you get them to vote. And once they, you get all the yeses in one and the noes in one, and then you can put them into groups based on, on that. And then, and then, Get them to prepare something and then debate or you can pair them up with you know two people who are for two people who are against and get them to debate with each other and do that in small groups uh, another thing i've done um, when we're talking about multicultural individuals so individuals holding two or more cultures within them um, looking at the dimensions of number of cultures that you identify with and then the extent to which they're integrated or not uh, so do you do you see them all together or do you separate them by place? And I kind of draw a grid, you know, that's four categories. Which are you, one, two, three, or four? Do you have lots or do you have a few cultures? Uh, and do you, do you integrate them or do you separate them? Put people into those four groups where they've got that in common and have them discuss where did that come from? Um, and what does that mean for your everyday life? And then, uh, and then have them bring that together. A, a helpful thing to do on that virtually is to run Google Docs at the same time. So uh, for example, you've got a, a case discussion going, you put people into groups to work out what advice would you give to the, the protagonist in this situation? Or what do you think is going on? They're working in subgroups. If you give them a, some kind of a shared document like a Google Doc, all of the students can write on it at the same time and they can all see what the other groups are discussing 
while they're talking about it. And so that tends to escalate the quality of discussion because everybody can see that everybody is talking about it at the same time. Um, and then when you bring everybody back into the whole group, you, you've already moved forward a lot and you can kind of take the outcome of that discussion. Um, so those are some, some quick examples. Do you have other examples, Harry? Well, I'm just gonna say uh, in this past section of my online MBA, I had a number of students say that the Delta Beverages team decision-making exercise was by far the best team exercise they had done in their MBA, online MBA program. Uh, so it, it really works. And for those of you listening, if you're familiar with the survival situations, you know, Arctic survival, desert survival, it is set up on, the, on that principle where you have to rank uh, 15 characteristics of, a, uh, of an expatriate to, to hire. And a lot of these are things that you can do asynchronously. So uh, as, as Harry said, his course, 95% of it is asynchronous. Um, but asynchronous doesn't mean that the students are not synchronous. They may be getting together in groups at a time that they agree. Uh, and, and then they're working as a small group together and then putting together some kind of input uh, for it. Uh, I'm seeing another comment here from Teodoro. Yeah, you just put it up. Um, we're looking at digitized new new kinds of businesses, new types of businesses uh, driven or pushed by dis digitization. Is digitization going to change the way businesses are managed? Uh, yes and no, right? The fundamentals may still be there, but um, I, I I think, and this goes back to to Harry's alignment model. Um, if you look at the way the information flow is working, if digitization means that you're getting faster ability to prototype and experiment and it also means you're getting information so you can get customer information more quickly and you can get it distributed across decision makers that i think that radically changes how you can make decisions in organizations uh, and organizations that that maintain kind of a top-down hierarchy um, without empowering the decision making are are going to have uh, difficulties, um, and and then some cultures will adapt to different aspects of that in different ways. Harry, what do you think? Digitization well, going to change the way business is done? The uh, the alignment model. It's clear that one of two of the elements that you have to have in alignment are the task and the people. Uh, so it says a lot about who you hire and the skills needed. So you need to have people that have the skills necessary to function in a digital world uh, and increase digitization. And so that's not always necessarily going to be the people you currently have in the organization. And what I have seen over and over again, not in this particular issue, but is companies trying to uh, force fit people into jobs that uh, they really don't have the skills for. As a quick example, uh, one senior executive was telling me about, in his, in his company, uh, he was being told to use the inside salespeople, get rid of the outside salespeople, use the inside salespeople in their, in their stead. And the question is, do they have the same skills to go knocking on doors and generate business that that the other people have. So as we move into digitization, companies are really going to have to think a lot about how that task or work system <clears throat> and the type of people that you need to uh, to manage that. Because you could wind up with a, a, a misalignment. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And structure as well. Structures can be flatter with digitization. Yeah. Uh, and not just information flow, but but manufacturing and uh, feedback. So yeah, I think it's really interesting. Uh, that's that's why we that's why we're talking about the ninth edition now, right? But what what keeps changing? Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that question specifically when I was at a uh, an Academy of Management conference when the last time we had them. And people were talking about these types of things, and it made me realize that uh, there has to be the fit between the task and the people uh, as we move into the new digital world. Yeah, yeah good. 
We've got another question here from from Cambridge, but I it's I love Teodoro. Thank you very much for being active. I, it's it's really helpful to Harry and me to have to have that uh, and Don Mori for asking Don for asking a question too. Uh, if anybody else does, please, because it's really helpful for Harry and, and me to kind of know what what's on your mind, um, and also know that there are people out there. Thank you. <laughs> so, will current online experience change teaching? Well, I will go back to what I said earlier. Learning is more important than teaching. And one of the people that I mentored a couple of weeks ago uh, basically was just going to try to put her uh, syllabus from on the ground online. And it was chapter by chapter. You can't do that. You need to think in modules. You need to think differently. So is it going to change? It's going to change teachers. It's going to change faculty. And I was I was on a, uh, a Zoom meeting yesterday learning about Canvas because I've never taught on Canvas, although my course is being transitioned to it. And this one person was talking about a couple of faculty members that she was having trouble with, and she was the uh, area group coordinator. And these two people kept on, no, the student, they're going to do it my way. I don't care. This is I'm going to do it 11 o'clock in the morning, and they're going to do it my way. And of course. And you have people in Dubai and Barcelona. That doesn't always work. So, yes, it's going to change the educational experience. And I think you need to think more about uh, creating and managing and architecting, structuring the learning experience than the teaching. Some of my advice to new uh, faculty members is we go in and uh, evaluate uh, new faculty members, is I find too many new uh, PhDs that are teaching uh, for the first time or second time, all they want to do is teach their students every framework or concept they learned in their PhD program. And one of the things you have to remember is we're not training PhDs. We're training people who want to be managers, who want to get out into the practicing world. So you need to think about where they are, where they're coming from, and that learning is more important than teaching. Yeah, I, and I, I agree. Uh, I like the way that you said that, Harry. It's going to change teachers. Um, I've been uh, I've been researching virtual teams for a long time. As I said, my interest is in multicultural teams, and of course, most multicultural international teams are also virtual teams. Uh, so, 2000 was the first the first study that I published on on virtual teams, and um, what I've always found fascinating is that the virtual mode offers some benefits that the face to face mode doesn't offer. Um, and, and including the ability to reflect a little bit uh, while you're in the decision making process, it um, equals power a little bit or it takes away some of the power dynamics that are related to demographics, for example, or even language. Uh, it, it reduces that and all of those are good for decision making and, and they're good for learning. Um, and so I've always been an advocate of trying to bring in virtual modes as into the face-to-face -face world too. What I and and these past few months, I've been on a lot of committees at our university and other places to help colleagues move online more. Um, and what I find fascinating and really fun is watching people discover the first time they teach online. Oh, this is going to be scary. It's going to be uh, you know, doing case teaching, interactive. How am I going to make that work? And they try it and they go, oh, my gosh. And, you know, some of the comments that came from people who never speak up in class were way better when they could type them, uh, when they could have some time to work on this asynchronously and actually implement it before we came back to it. The, the discussion was way better. Um, and, yeah, I so I actually think that um, for people that, that really love to teach and engage this, uh, it's going to broaden our repertoire of how we teach. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's an exciting change. And just to follow up on that, Martha, one of the things that I have noticed with online discussions and doing cases online in discussion boards, people are a lot, a lot more thoughtful uh, yeah. when they have to write it and other people can read it and it's not going away. Uh, so the, the comments have generally been very, very good and more thoughtful than necessary. In class, it's easy to pick up on somebody else's comment and get your participation points. 
It's a yeah. lot better when it's online than you have to write it. Yeah, again, the starting point is to think about uh, learning, not teaching. So really think from the student's perspective and how you can use the broad repertoire and, and the, the menu of things, options that you've got to facilitate that, uh, that learning. We have one last question from uh, Rebecca. Final bits of advice or online resource recommendations for lecturers and instructors. I'll go first on this one, Harry. Can I? Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> no. So, so you know, again, final advice is is to go back to uh, just ha have this tattooed on your forehead. Learning is more important than teaching. Um, and if you start with that as as the um, starting point in developing your courses and your sessions and modules, that kind of unleashes uh, some creativity and some ways of thinking about it. Um, Online resource recommendations, I've found that there are tons. Harvard in particular has a lot of really good ones out right now. So does Stanford, so does Cambridge, right? There, there, there are tons. The, I always find the hard part now is that there are so many resources that it's hard to know which ones. And, and they're all very, very good. So I think it almost doesn't matter which ones you go to. Go to the ones that, that resonate with you. Um, I, I would say uh, my final bit of advice is, you know, jump in and try it and, and use the students as your partners to do this. Have lots of conversations with colleagues because I've found that the best conversations that have led to the, the best increases in teaching are conversations with colleagues and with students about how did you do that? Where did that app come from? Um, how, how do, it, which video is that? Which tool is that? And it's almost like those conversations uh, but with colleagues and peers are more important than going to the online resource. Yeah. I have I have seen like you a lot of uh, Harvard Business School uh, mm -hmm. and things that are open to not just graduates right. but to to anybody. Uh, we're fortunate at Northeastern is they've been putting a lot of resources into online teaching. Uh, and we have an instructional design group that has been running courses for us. So. Check your own university uh, and see if they have anything like it. My guess is most universities today are really uh, having to think about this. Uh, and some are way behind others. But uh, Harvard is a good place to, to begin for those uh, webinars. Just reading Theodora's comment here. Graduated online in March. Real practice in Mexico now. We're, okay. That's beautiful. I love it. What a what a great example. We're, we're in Mexico, Theodora. Harry's taught a lot there. Yeah. For 21 years, I have taught at Ipade in Mexico City, Monterey, and only once in Guadalajara. Yeah. That's good. Okay, well, so I think it's time to wrap up. Um, I'll, I'll I'll wrap up and then and then you can add to it. Or do you want do you want to go first, Harry? And then I'll, okay. <laughs> um, so so oh, for Eastern Acapulco, that's great. That's great. Thanks, Tito. Um, I, I hope that one of the things that you've seen from today is that Harry and I um, really care a lot about this book and and actually less about the book and more about the people who are learning from it. Um, and, and so over the years, we've really, really worked on crafting it to be practical and to help learners kind of pull through a, a, a curriculum that helps them develop skills and ways of thinking and responsibility around that. And at the same time, we also really care about the people who are teaching the course. Uh, and so we've thought through as much as we can ways of helping instructors to uh, facilitate that learning. And at the same time, we're just, we just love the topic. And so uh, we, you know, we love getting together and, and working on it, um, always learning new things, rewriting the, uh, the, all of the context to be um, more current all the time. Um, and so uh, we love hearing from people who work with the book, getting their input and incorporating that into next editions. It really affects the next editions. So um, thanks very much for tuning into this. Uh, and please reach out to us if you have any questions at all um, that we can help you with in teaching this. And one of the things I find is, particularly if you're dealing with practicing managers, 
or people that want to become managers, they want tools, they want takeaways, they want ways of thinking about how they can do their job better. And I think this book provides a lot of those opportunities uh, and feedback that I have gotten from uh, our online MBAs is that you know it's really useful. The MBI framework, the alignment framework, they go off and they use these in their company. But if you use them uh, domestically, because a lot of the uh, places mm -hmm. working these days, even in the United States or Canada, are multicultural. And the alignment framework works uh, whether you're working internationally or domestically. So it is, uh, it's useful. And there are takeaways for, for managers. Thank you all for, for joining us. And uh, we're delighted with the questions and having you uh, spend this little bit of time with us. And please feel free to email us or contact us through Cambridge University Press if you have more questions. Thank you.